Thank you very much. We now have the one, the only, Dave McNeil. Uh, I'm Baker's Corporate Lean Champion, uh, heavily involved with LCI, AGC, CII. Uh, before I became the Lean Champion, I was an operations manager. I've been a project manager, superintendent, uh, estimator, and project engineer for Baker uh, in my 20-year career with them. So who is Baker? What do we do? Just real briefly, we're a subcontractor. Uh, turnkey frames is what we build. We build stuff out of concrete. Uh, 43 years in business, $70 million last year. Uh, done 35 plus or minus lean projects. So the potential of lean. I, I say, and I was actually quoted in the ENR in this uh, last week, you know, lean can, has delivered for us easily 50% fewer injuries. We, we can do them 20% faster, and we can save 20% in cost. And the cool thing is you don't usually just get one or the other of those. You get, usually you get all three if they're doing it well. And those numbers are actually fairly ratcheted down. The, number, the first year of safety, we had a 78% uh, safety advantage for jobs that were doing lean than jobs that were not. Um, we've done things 78% faster in form work and things, and, and costs have been 50% uh, better in some areas. But those are good averages. But it, 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 it harkens back to something I heard Greg Howe say in a presentation, and he, he um, kind of paraphrasing, but he said, if there's anything I've learned about lean over the last, I forget what he said, 20 something years, it's these two things. One, lean is hard to do. Lean is hard to do. And two, his results don't sell. I would agree with, with uh, Greg that lean is hard to do. So to give you a little bit of background on this case, I'm gonna explain a little bit about our training program, not go into any detail, just give you a little flavor for it. Um, we call our lean training special forces. It, it's what sets us apart. It's what sets the lean crews apart from the traditional crews. We call them our special forces. It's definitely our lead and key personnel. It's our foreman, it's our superintendents, it's our project managers. Incident injury free is a baseline. We conduct the lean boot camps with our crews. We do the book club with the Toyota Way. We read the Toyota Way by Jeffrey Liker. We definitely get into the last planner system, which is all about the pull planning, the sticky notes, the weekly work planning. We teach our foreman um, job instruction. That's uh, TWI stands for Training Within Industry. It was a World War II program that taught people how to teach uh, after action reviews as well, looking at the thing after we do it one time. Also could call that a first run study, but we like the military term after action reviews. And we call this system Baker 2.0. It's an upgrade to our traditional system that we'd been operating on before 2007. Uh, we take our crews to uh, Toyota in Georgetown. If you haven't been, I highly suggest you, you go to the Toyota plant in Georgetown, Kentucky, and uh, see them making Camrys, and you see all these tools in, in, in operation. Uh, sitting at that table are, are three foremen, a superintendent, a project engineer, a line and grade engineer, and a project manager, building airplanes to learn the lean philosophies. The last planner meetings, um, a lot of written, a lot of uh, coloring on the board. You see them coloring in some things. Um, after action reviews, this is a crew conducting an after action review at Gemba, at where the work is, uh, where the value is being added to the work. And they're nine stories up in a concrete core, not back uh, down on the ground in a trailer. Uh, we share our practices where we can. This is a superintendent and a uh, decking foreman going over a incident that happened on a project in North Carolina. This picture was taken in DC, I know because I took it. And they're talking about a failure of uh, some decking that collapsed. Nobody was hurt, but um, they were using that same material. So they sent a bulletin out to every job that we had that was using that kind of material saying, don't do what this job in North Carolina did because your decking could fall down. So that's a little bit about the people, about the training, what we do with them. So here's the case itself. Uh, it's this and Krupp Steel Mill, Mount Vernon, Alabama. Our crews lovingly refer to that as LA, Lower Alabama. <laughs> Um, we poured overall on that site 415,000 cubic yards. Big chunk, yeah. Um, the part, the case study, if you can see there, is those two buildings. They're, they're starting to take the shape of each other, and they're actually identical buildings. Very, very, uh, for all intents and purposes, they're identical. And they're about 50 feet away from each other on the same site. So they're hot dip galvanizing lines, they're big equipment foundations. Uh, the one with the blue arrow is, was done traditionally. The one with the yellow arrow, arrow is, uh, was done using lean tools, lean processes. So the situation, uh, those, those packages were our fifth and sixth packages that we had gotten on the site. 
uh, took our contract on site to over $210 million. We actually had 985 craftsmen at one point on the site, big site. Um, it depleted the resources of our industrial group. They were scrambling for people, but it was good work, and we, uh, we needed the, the work at the time, so we were really scrambling to get people. So when we bid this last chunk, we got a call saying that they're not going to give us this job unless we can prove that we can staff it with people that aren't already, aren't already on the job. They didn't want us to water down the other crews and then have them fall down on their faces. So a call was made up to the Midwest. I had some people available. I said, sure, I'll loan you, I'll loan you two of these guys that I have. And, and the two guys are these two guys, Jim and Joe. So this is really a story about Jim and Joe. Uh, Jim on the left, he's a project manager with a superintendent type background. Joe on the right, superintendent with kind of a surveying background. Uh, both of them in their mid-30s, or early 30s actually. Um, their mission was not to spread lean to the project they were going to. They had had experience with lean on two projects. Their mission was to help them get this job done. Jim was supposed to order rebar and embeds. Joe was supposed to be a layout engineer. That's all they were supposed to do. So this is what the site looked like when they got there, May 17th, 2009. You can see the, uh, the traditional line in blue. There's some work that's already in place. You can see some concrete's been poured, and there's actually structural steel being set. You can see a, a, a one bay of steel is, is being set vertically. If you look up on the yellow piece, there's a couple holes that have been dug. That's just getting ready to get started. So that's what they were sent for. So in the movie Apocalypse Now, the, uh, the, the story, if you haven't seen it, is they're, they're, they're going up this river in Vietnam. They're supposedly supposed to cross over into Cambodia. And they get to this last army outpost, which is the Dulong Bridge. And as they're pulling up at night, there's, there's all this chaos going on. And there's just shooting and flares. And, and there's actually soldiers swimming out with suitcases saying, take us home, take us home. This is a disaster. And they, they kind of shoo them away. And they dock at night. And, and it's just a mess. So. I'd say that most of our traditional jobs, they're much like the Dulong Bridge. They're just in chaos. It's just So when they get there, they're seeing the Dulong Bridge is what's happening on the one side. So what are we doing there? We, we kind of take the hole uh, looking like this. It's been sheeted and shored with the soldier piles and lagging. There's caissons drilled, and that's where we start. Uh, we start building the foundations, the bottoms of the equipment foundations. And then eventually we get it up to, to grade level. That's, that's our job. So this was the traditional line, by the way. And you can see the structural steel being set in the background behind the port, right up, right up against the concrete. So looking at the two structures, similarities, they're basically identical. 100,000 cubic yards on one, 100,000 cubic yards on the other, 50 feet apart. So the site and the weather are the same. The suppliers are all the same. Same rebar suppliers, same steel suppliers. The engineer and the customers were the same and not lean. They, we were allowed to put one person that could look over both and that was the superintendent. He could run both sides of this. So the differences, um, and there were some. The one started, the, the lean job started three months after the traditional one started. So the traditional one had a three month head start. Uh, the labor pool, uh, the, the lean project got the bottom of the bottom of the barrel. That was the last project to go on this site. So, Craftsman number 800 through 985 were the ones that went to this job. There were some lessons learned. They did some things out of sequence on the first one, and there were some design changes. Uh, so there, there, there was a little bit of lessons learned already from the, from the original one. The management team was obviously completely different. One was an industrial group. One was a commercial, lean-trained group. Uh, the division cultures were very different. Uh, when the guys came and said they're going to, to try to teach them to do lean, I thought they were crazy. It just wouldn't work. So, and obviously the, the lean versus traditional. So what did, what did Jim and Joe actually do? They convinced the superintendent to try something new, and that was last planner, basically. Pool planning, weekly work planning, get your act together. Uh, they brought in suppliers to help create these new delivery schedules, and they did it collaboratively. And they conducted lunch and learns. They started teaching them these Toyota Way principles um, to help them uh, with, their, with what they were doing each week. So here's a picture of the Lunch and Learn. That's Jim on the far right. And he's, he's, he's pre-printed out some Toyota Way principles and how, how can we apply these. And he had been through it a couple times, so he had some lessons learned from his old Toyota Way book. And he brought those back and, and was kind of giving them fish. He wasn't teaching them to fish. He was just kind of giving them fish to get them started with lean. Then they came up with this very complex area identification system. I'll give you guys a minute to take it all in. 
Yeah. The, so they said, what was, what's your problem? And they're like, we can't find anything. There are acres and acres and acres of rebar and anchor bolts and embeds all over the place. And they said, we've got to clean it up. We've got to start sorting it out. We've got to start putting stuff in the right areas instead of just chucking it wherever you can. Like if you were on the Dulong Bridge, that's what you would do. You would just throw it off the boat. Now they're saying no. So here's a picture of a form area, uh, some forms that were being built up. They're sorted, they're straightened, it's cleaned up, there's no trash. They're standardized, they're colored, the sizes are in the right area, and uh, then they had to keep it up. That's the 5S. Embeds coming from a supplier, we had them pre-color code these when they came to us, so when, they took, when the forklift driver took them off, he knew exactly where to go put those. He didn't have to look, it up, look up a shipping ticket or anything like that, they were pre-color coded as they came to us. As we were building up form work, we were even color coding that so we knew which, which piece of the, the mill it was supposed to go to. They sat down, like I said before, and, and with, the, with the suppliers and mapped out. The, the pink stickies on there are, um, are milestone dates for completion. The yellow, I believe, are uh, needed on site dates, and the purple are um, release dates. So they all had, they had an agreement on this. This is the superintendent getting ready for the weekly meeting. Um, he's not filling out a weekly work plan in writing. He's coloring it on, on a board behind plastic. Then the superintendent or the foreman would come in. They actually put a piece of plexiglass on their table and they would slide the drawings underneath there and they would color what, they're, what, what they were going to get done next week. This was kind of neat. A foreman had some downtime and he brought his crew in. The foreman being the last planner in the, in the, in the high-vis yellow and brought his crew in to explain to him what was going on based on the coloring that they had done in the meeting the day before. So a quick quiz. Um, what motivated the other four Baker teams on site to try lean? Remember, this was just one of six pieces. There were four, well, five other pieces on site, and they wanted to try lean. So I'm wondering if you guys can guess what motivated them to try this. A, mandated by corporate executives. Does any hands go up? Incentivized with large cash bonuses. The staff attended an LCI seminar. Maybe, maybe. Or D, their buddies on the lean team were getting to the bars much sooner. <laughs> Anyone think it's not D? It's D, guaranteed. That's what was happening. The guys on the lean project were planning their work and they were executing it in eight hours and they were getting to happy hour. The guys on the, the get her done do long bridge side were, 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 had the hair on fire, they're running around, they're not know what they're doing, they're pouring at eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night, and they're not getting to the bar for happy hour, and, they, and they're jealous. So jealousy plays a big role in lean. Uh, cooling circus, this is one of the other chunks of work. I told you there were five or six other chunks. This is one of them, the big baths where they take the steel and uh, molten hot and uh, cool it down. So they were one of the teams that came in. That little red circle was what that picture was of. And it, so it's those blue areas. So they came to the lean trailer and looked around and, and saw some of the things and the writing and the plastic and the calendars and all this stuff. So they said, that's going to get us to the bar sooner. That's what we need to do. So they bought calendars. They bought plastic. They colored drawings. And they couldn't realize why they weren't getting to the bar any sooner. They did everything that the other guys were doing, right? Wrong. <laughs> they didn't have Jim and Joe. That's what they didn't have. So here it is on October 28th. Um, the inside had just finished pouring, and the lean project, you can see where the arrow's pointing, is actually the last pour on that line. They finished within a week of each other. And the one, remember, had a three-month head start. Peak manpower. The traditional project had 420 at its peak. The lean project never had more than 270. That's a picture of a blowout, which typically you don't see a lot of pictures of because people don't like to admit that something went wrong on their site and they had, they dumped 20 yards of concrete down in the basement. That wasn't a fun day, but they took pictures, they did an after action review and figured out why they had this mistake and they didn't make it again the rest of the time. So it brings me to some lessons learned. You know, you can roll out lean at any stage. This was the last in the line of the projects. You don't have to follow the playbook exactly. Uh, again, we like to color versus filling out um, filling out uh, weekly work plans. Uh, it's not about the tools. Obviously, it's not about the tools. It's really about those lean champions that, that drive it. It's about the Jims and the Joes. So if you want to know about what, how do you sustain lean, and sustaining it is actually very, very hard, my answer is create champions. Don't roll out tools. I, and when I go to coach teams, I don't say, I'm here to roll out last planner. I'm here to do pull planning. I'm here to make a champion. Who wants to be it? Which one of you at this table want to be the champion and, and take this when I'm gone? 
yeah, I'll, I'll teach you all the stuff in the sticky notes, but we're gonna, that's, that's my mission when I go to a project is to make Jim's and Joe's. So what happened there? They engaged the field, instilled a vision, visually what they were gonna do. They planned collectively instead of silos. And the project manager gave me this one. He said, what we really did was we created an environment for people to learn and to innovate. And we could see what the guys on the Dulong Bridge were doing, and we didn't want to do that. We wanted to do it differently over here. So some results. Safety record. Actually, both projects had almost the identical safety record, but when you compared it to the rest of the company, it was 65% better than our 2009 company average. Formwork rental, they used 75% less formwork on the lean project as they did on the traditional one because they were actually had time to recycle it and go back and get it instead of just leaving it behind. <laughs> yeah, they, we do that. Equipment rental, they used 28% less equipment, less lifts, less uh, generators because they were able to share. You know, everybody didn't have to have their own thing. The duration, uh, it was 19% faster, the, way it, uh, the completion date and the, the TK owner's rep said it's the fastest one's ever been built anywhere in the world. End of job overtime. This is the uh, hair on fire at the end, you know, flood the job with 400 people. 68% uh, difference in, in end of job overtime. The, uh, the traditional crew was just going crazy at the end trying to finish, and the lean crew just kind of walked across the finish line at the same time. Labor productivity, 12% better labor productivity cubic yards per man hour. Costs, depending on the area or the activity, the way we had it broken out, it, uh, the least amount of savings we had was 10% on an activity, and we had as much as 28%. When you rolled it all up into the whole project, the cost difference was actually 17.4%. Uh, we looked at formwork productivity alone, just the productivity of the forming crews, not the placing, not the reinforcing, just the forming. And we compared the yellow being the lean to the, to the blue being the traditional, 8%, 29% for walls, 61% better for the columns. So again, the way I see that too is the, the, the less um, complicated it is, and the foundations were just kind of square boxes, the less of the savings, but there's still 8% still significant. But when you got more complex that had more embeds, more anchor bolts, more craziness, more haunches, ugly forming, the more lean paid off, 29%, 61% better in formwork productivity. So why did it work? First of all, I'll say for sure it was luck. Preparation, the Jim and Joe met the opportunity, the Dulong Bridge uh, project. They didn't know that it couldn't be done. Jim and Joe were just like, we're sick of it. We're not gonna do it this way. There is a better way. We uh, they did have credibility. They were field guys. They were field guys talking to field guys. They took action. They just tried something. I think I've seen several presentations today that said, just try something, start anywhere, just do something. And that's what they did. They got some quick wins early on with that complex area identification system that they invented. And they started with the need. They started with what was their biggest thorn in their side, and they got that one out, then they went to the next one and started pulling the thorns out. And the pace, the pace that they rolled it out, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. Or if you're dealing with your customer, it's keep it simple, sir. <laughs> don't, don't go too hog wild on this stuff. Just take it easy, it'll come. Biggest obstacle to lean, um, this is, I, I found this and I like this, I say the greatest obstacle is to discovery is not ignorance or lack of intelligence, it's the illusion of knowledge. We already know how to do this. We've been doing lean for years, blah, blah, blah. No, you know, it's thinking you already know it, you're thinking you already do it. Cautions. Just know that it, you know, lean requires discipline, perseverance, hard work. That's again why Greg said lean is hard. Results don't sell. Teams have to devote time and energy to making it better. Payoffs are down the road. Uh, it's not, it's, uh, lean is not a car wash, it's an investment. You're investing today so things run smoother, better down the road. So I like, Greg used to have uh, this, not this exact slide, but that question at, at, his, uh, at the end of his presentation. So what is, what is your level of ambition with lean? And you can make mall cops, right? In about an hour, you can show a mall cop how to use a billy club and a, and, a, and a radio, right? Or do you want to put a real investment in and really invest in your people and make something like special forces? You, those guys don't get made in, in a couple hours. That's years and years and years of training. Yeah, thank you.
Make champions. 5S eliminates treasure hunts. Visual progress tracking on floor plans. Get to the bar faster. You don't have to follow the playbook exactly. Just the, uh, the power of the two guys in the field that they could really affect the whole project. Using plexiglass tabletops to do weekly work planning. Bring in suppliers to help create delivery schedules. You, you can do it in LA. We know that we, from the California hospitals and LA, Alabama. Yeah. Um, it's not about the tools. That's the only other one I did not hear is it's not the tools. It's the, what, it's the people. Yeah. Why 50% less? Why, what, why um, do we have such better safety? It, it, it's hard to say exactly, uh, but I do know, like the, in the Gilbane example, you're, you're, you're exposing much less exposure. You're going down in the hole one time, down the ladder, you're doing your work, you're coming out once at the end of the day. You're not up and down, up and down, you're doing these treasure hunts, you're looking for material. It's not a mess, you're not tripping over things. Um, and it's, it's planned out. The safety's planned as well. The safety is, is planned just like the productivity is planned. What formwork do I need? What embeds do I need? What anchor bolts? What harnesses do I need? What do I need for ladders? What do I need for access and egress? It changes the level of thinking a little bit. So I think it's mainly reducing exposure. Is 5S a good place to start? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Dennis Sauer says, um, you know, you can't even do lean if you're not doing 5S. If you don't have the place cleaned up, you're not organized, then, you're, then you've got the Dulong Bridge. It's a mess, it's a chaos if you don't have 5S. So I think 5S is a great place to start. Why didn't the other team borrow Jim and Joe? <laughs> well, Jim and Joe were in the firefight of their lives, just trying to do their own jobs on their own piece, trying to pour 100,000 cubic yards in what wound up being six months. So 100,000 cubic yards is basically two stadiums worth of concrete that they're, that they're pouring. So it would not be easy to just simply take them and transplant them. And plus, it was kind of an underground thing. They, they just kind of did it on their own. And it wasn't until much later that they, that they realized they were getting to the bar sooner that they had a different mousetrap. They, they, they had some different Kool-Aid over there. So it just wouldn't have been easy because of the job load to take them over there and train them. Plexiglass work plan. Oh, through the week. Oh, OK, yeah, that was your, yeah, um, Todd's question. Um, they, they would uh, have an engineer that would go through after the, after the foreman would color it up and they'd write, okay, wall A, you know, from here to here on Monday, here to here Tuesday, these columns on Wednesday, and then they would take it and make that a, a written weekly work plan. But we didn't force the foreman to do that. They got to color, then we would send a, 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 a project engineer through afterwards and, and walk up to each of their plans and then write out the plan, and that became the written plan afterwards. So. The, the, um, did they transplant it, and, and, and uh, how did that work? And you've seen it work the other ways that the guys that have the skills lose it when they go to a job that's not run that way. I think it was, is was that kind of, okay. Um, they, um, they were convinced. They, they had done it on, like I said, two jobs. They'd each done two jobs this way. They were convinced that this, this is the best way to do this, and anything else is insane. And they even went against orders and everything else to do it and to, to sell that, that superintendent. One thing I didn't say too is the superintendent was so overrun with the one line and the Dulong Bridge kind of scenario going on that these guys came one day and said, hey, we think we can try this, this last planner stuff and these weekly work plans and pull planning. And he just said, sure, whatever. <laughs> he was so overrun with work that he was actually able to do that. And he said, sure. If you think it's going to make it better, I'll try anything. If it's going to make it my life easier because I'm working 16, 18 hours a day, I'll do it. So that's kind of softened it. Um, what happened to Jim and Joe? Uh, Joe is still with us. He's um, now on his fourth or fifth project, uh, lean project. Uh, he, he runs the meetings. I, uh, I just get reports every now and again on their PPC, which is usually in the mid to high 80s. Um, Jim has left the company, unfortunately, uh, found some other opportunities, and uh, he has taken lean to that company. So he keeps sending me pictures of boards and things that he's doing at his new company, and I, and I couldn't be happier for Jim. So uh, that's what's happened to the two of them. Thank you very much.